Okay, so records the starting address of the process um, address space. And then the second thing is the bound register, which just tells us the size of the address space. So the way we did our translation from a physic from a virtual address to a physical address is as follows. Let's assume this is our memory. We had our process address space in here. It included the text, data, heap, and stack that was growing down. So this is for the process. This is the process view. It thinks this is address zero. This is address all apps, no matter how many um, we have. And then we're going to map this somewhere on physical memory. And this is going to be the base address that is stored in the base register. So for example, let's say if it is a thousand and it's just a we, we store 1000 in the base register. And this is the bound. OK, if we wanted to put another process in there, we're going to just do the exact same thing. But in another place in memory, so let's assume we can put it somewhere. And then we have another base address. All right. So do you recall what the formula was from going from a virtual address to a physical address? So if I want to go from a virtual, I'm going to use VA for virtual address to PA for physical address. What did we do? Yep. Yep. All we did is that we just added is the base register plus the virtual address. And this must be smaller than the base register plus the bound. OK, so that's pretty much our um, approach so far. And we saw we had two problems in this approach. Do you recall what those problems were? Kind of talked about them in the last few minutes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So we had two problems in this case. Well, the first problem is we refer to it as external fragmentation. And just to quickly remind you, let's jump here where we have process one, process two, and we want to allocate room for process three. But because of the way we're allocating things, we have, this is 100 bytes free, 50 bytes, 100 bytes. So we have two, 250 bytes free in memory, but because they're not contiguous, we're not going to be able to store P3. In. So one thing we can do is rearrange P1 and P2, but that's going to be wasteful because we're going to have to copy and, and copy memory a lot um, in order to do that. The other problem was that we are wasting space. Specifically, this area of the memory, we're going to have to pre-allocate this area of memory for each process. So we're going to have to some, do some, some sort of mental gymnastics to figure out how much space are we going to allocate for each process, because de depending on how much memory we anticipate, this process is going to ask for, right? And we're going to have to keep this free so the process can use it for its heap and the process can use it for its stack. And if we end up mistaken that the process is actually not used as much as we anticipated, 
we just wasted a lot of space. So we're going to have to um, figure out how to solve these two problems. We're going to first focus on the problem of wasting space. And then we're going to see that segmentation alone, our, our initial approach towards the solution, which is segmentation, is not going to be enough to solve external fragmentation, but it's going to allow us to save on space a little bit. So let's take a look at what the thought process is behind improving this approach. So we had uh, text, data, heap, and stack. So the initial approach was that I'm going to take the entire address space and put it in one slot in physical, right? And because of that, I had to pre-allocate space for each one of those segments. So what do you think a good way to do or a, a good way to resolve the issue of wasting space? How, what, what, what thing we can do to avoid this issue of, of wasting the space that we have? So is there, is there a requirement for us to store things contiguous? Right? There's nothing that's asking us to store the data next to the text, the text next to the heap, and the heap next to the stack. So what would we do in that case? What do you think are going to be the law? What, what do you think the, the logical next step is going to be? Yeah. Yeah, so we're just going to split up our address space instead of taking it as one piece and allocating it in physical memory. We're going to split it up according to its different components. And we're going to allocate each one in a different place in memory. So I'm going to allocate text here. I'm going to allocate the data here. I'm going to allocate the heap here. And I'm just going to allocate the stack somewhere. So now I don't have to pre-allocate memory for my stack and my heap, right? If I need more memory, I can just add a segment to that, right? So if I need more more room for the heap, I can add a segment for a heap. Make the tag make just the heap larger. I don't have to make the entire address space larger, um, and I can dynamically add room to it. Same thing goes for the stack. And since text and data are generally going to be small, then in that case we can just store them um, separately. Yeah. Yeah, but if I need more, let's say I run out of space in the address space. So here, here's the difference between the two. If I run out of space and for the heap, in this case, all I have to do is add one segment, right? If I run out of space in the base and bounds register, I'm going to have to evict the entire process space, reallocate something that's larger, and then put the entire address space, right? So that's the difference between the two. I only have to work on a local thing instead of working on the tires. OK. So now the process of going from a virtual address to a physical address involves two things. First step, find memory segment. So each one of these is going to be referred to as a segment of memory. 
This is a segment of memory. And each one of them, now we're going to generalize the idea of a base and bound and give, give each one of them a base and bound register. So the stack has its own base and bound. The heap has its own base and bound. And the text has its own base and bound. The data has its own base and bound register. OK. So step one, we're going to find the memory segment that the address resides in. And two, touch the address in the segment. at the offset specified by the address. So in a sense, there's two things I need to figure out. Anytime I want to access memory in this schema, I have to first figure out which segment, and then the segment has some, some stuff in it. So I have to figure out where in the segment I have to figure things out. Or, or where in the segment I have to look for things. Okay, so let's take an example of what we're going to do. So we're going to split our address space. Let's say we have 16 bits into two. We're going to split our address, every address, into one that refers to which segment are we going to be in. So we're going to refer to this as the segment number. And the other part is going to be the offset within the segment. OK, so how many bits do you think we need for the segment number? Right, because we have four segments per address space, we only need two bits to figure out which segment we're we going to be, be moving in. So we're just going to take the top two bits. So if this is 16 bits, we're going to take bits 15, bits 14, and then those are going to be which segment are we in? And then we, we end up with 14 bits for the offset within the segment. So in a, a question for you, what is the largest possible segment size we can have in this specific scenario? Yeah. Can you say that again? 2 to the 14. So I have 14 bits to index into the offset or into the, the actual segment. So the number of those indices is nothing but 2 to the 14. So 2 to the 14 bytes per segment. So 2 to the 14 is 2 to the 4 times 2 to the 10 which is going to be 64 kilobytes. So now I know that at most, my segment is going to be 64 kilobytes. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be 64 kilobytes, which is another important distinction in here is that segments do not have to be of the same size. OK, so I can have my data segment since it's small. I can have it to be a small segment. My text segment would be small. My stack and heap segments will have to be larger because I have to accommodate more 
data creation on the fly in Lucas. Questions? Okay, so we've talked about how do we split our memory address. We've talked about how do we do the allocation. Now the last thing we want to do is figure out how do we find the base and bound register for each segment in our memory, right? So the, 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 the problem before was easy. Uh, I, I just keep a process. For each process, I keep one register. I put the base address in it, and anytime I need a, 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 a um, translation, I just get that base register, add to it the offset, and I'm done. But now there's a, an extra step, which is finding the memory segment that the address resides in. Yeah. That 64 kilobyte is specifically for a 16 bit processor, right? Yes, yeah. So we're going to have to find the memory segment that the address resides in. So what does it mean to find the memory segment that the address resides in? What do I have to know about the memory segment in order to resolve the address? Let's go back to the figure we have here. Right. So we have to find the base and the bounds for each memory segment. And in order to remember, remember all of that information, we're going to ask for the hardware to help us remember that information. And the hardware comes equipped with a piece called the memory management unit. Management. Or it's typically referred to as the MMU. So this is a small piece of hardware that comes on your motherboard, right? And it handles the communication between the memory and the CPU. We're going to ask the memory management unit to recall or remember the mapping between each segment and its base and bound register. OK, so here's a small example we're going to do. The MMU is going to store something like this. First column is going to be the segment. So we have four segments, so the code, um, heap, stack, and we have a few more before the text and so on. The next thing is we're going to start remembering the base and the bound. So let's say in this example we have 32 kilo K is the address starting address for the code. 36 K is the starting address for the heap and 28 K is the starting address for our stack. And then for the bound, let's assume they're all equal of size 2K. But keep in mind that the bound register does not have to be the same for each and every segment in our memory. Now, the, the MMU is going to remember a few more things. So the first thing is we call protection bits or protection information. This tells us, am I supposed to only read from this part of the memory, or am I supposed to actually read and write to this part of the memory? For example, in the code section, I'm only supposed to read and execute. So I'm not supposed to change my code on the fly. If I change my code on the fly, this means something bad is happening, right? The next thing is for the heap, I can read and write. I can read and write. And the last thing it must remember, let's take go back and focus on our stack. So let's just focus on this guy. Where is the base register for the stack? Right 
Is it the lower address or the higher address? The higher address, because the stack grows down. So in fact, this, whoops, is not correct. And the actual base starts at the top. And the way we distinguish that is we have an entry and we just ask if this grows positively or negatively. If it grows positively, we just, we're growing up. If, we, if it grows negatively, it's growing down. So this is a one bit, so this is going to be like one, one, and zero. So here's a quick example. Um, let's just do it together and see um, how do we do this translation. The virtual address we're going to be looking at is 4200, which in binary comes down to being 0, 1, 0, 0, 3, 0, 5 zeros. One one zero one and then three zeros. Okay, so we want to find the physical address that corresponds to the virtual address forty two hundred or this representation in there. And let's assume specifically that the code is segment zero, the heap is segment one, the stack is segment two, and the data is segment three. So in which segment? Does this address reside in? Yeah. Yeah, it's going to be on the heap. The way we know that, we're going to chop the address the same way we suggested we're going to do. This is the segment number. And this is the offset. So the segment number allows us to go into the MMU and figure out that it's at the heap and its base is 36K. So the first step in our physical address is we're going to add 36 times 1024. So that's the base value. Base of heap segment. Next thing we're going to do, we just have to add the offset, and we just add the offset as is. And this in decimal is going to come down to being 104. And we get the actual address that we want. Now, when I want to go to memory to access something, I take this address, which is going to be, let's just write it down for completion, 36968. So when I want to go to memory, I'm going to tell memory, please fetch address 36, go to memory, 968 with this address. OK. Questions on translating a virtual address to a physical address when we are employing segmentation. OK. So we see that. Now we have solved the problem of. Wasted memory by splitting it up into several several pieces. And those pieces do not necessarily have to be the same size. Now I'm going to give you an example here. Let's say we are in a place in memory where we have, let's say, four processes. I allocated process one here, so that's its text. I allocated its data here. I allocated a big bunch of memory for its heap and a kind of relatively smallish memory or is set. So now what happened is that I 
another process came in. So this is process B1. Another process came in and it put its text somewhere here. It's data here. And it's stack and it's here. So because of this variability in size, you can see now I have a lot of empty small holes that are composed of empty space. But I can't really use them for anything because they're so tiny. So because of the fact that I'm allowing things to be of different size, I'm causing my memory to be fragmented. So if I want to add a new process for now, I might have the entire space for it, but I cannot add it because those small pieces are fragmented into our map. So what do you think the logical next step is to solve this problem? Yeah. It's the same thing you do, like, I don't know, this drive where you have to keep back in every now and then? So one thing you can do, which is great, is you just defragment every now and then. Now, the trick with memory is that things come and go very frequently, right? So it's not so you're not storing something permanent on memory. So determining when to fragment can be a problem. The other, the other issue is that if I'm going to pause all of my processes to defragment my memory, I'm just going to cause a huge delay because I have to copy. So what other constraint can you enforce on your memory segments to get rid of the problem of, of fragmentation? Yeah. Yeah, so one thing you can do is you can be um, kind of this evolved down to being smarter about where you allocate. Right. Um, but here's Another scenario. Let's say we did that. We had our the text for one, text for the second, text for the third. And then this process terminated. So we are back to the same problem. We have two small chunks of data and a small chunk of data in between. Right? Our free space is not condensed together in one place. So we want our unit of placement and replacement in the, in the memory to be efficient. So what can you do other than um, trying to um, force things or being um, smarter about your allocation, which can help, or doing a defragmentation every now and then? Can you do something to the size of every segment? To get away of this problem once and for all? Yeah. Can you split each segment up into multiple chunks? Okay. Like so, for some. Yeah, go ahead. So like if your text doesn't all fit in one like in one area, but you have two smaller places that can combine fit in, just split your text into two separate areas. So you have one area for the start of the text and the other part of the text is in another area of memory. Okay. So that's you're getting close. So what if you have like, you know, small chunks of like few kilobytes available. You're going to have to store like your data is going to be stored in, in a few kilobytes every every here and then, and you're going to have to find a way to map them all together. Right. So but in that spirit, what can you do to make sure anytime something is freed, you can reuse it as is? So go back to our um, uh, parking lot analogy, right? Where people were parking in very, in very weird ways, right? And, and they, they left places in between them that were not usable anymore. So what's the solution in this case? Default chunk. So that's exactly what we're going to do in the next step. So we just put, we, we measure how many on average the length of a vehicle is, and we're going to divide our parking lot into equal sized chunks. This way, whenever a car leaves, I can automatically put the car in its place. 
let's assume people don't have to go out of their doors and open all of that. So uh, it's a different problem to worry about. So what we what we're gonna do now is we're gonna take our piece of memory and we're gonna subdivide it into equally sized chunks. So this is our main memory. And we're going to divide it into equally sized chunks. So typically, so these are all equal. Typically in, in, in modern systems, this is going to be four kilobytes. And some, some systems exist, um, support eight or 16 kilobytes per chunk size. And the other thing we're going to do is now we're going to consider our address space as simply composed of, again, equal sized chunks. So those are not equal. So let's re redraw that. One, two, three, four, assume those are equal for now. OK, yeah. Are those what I referred to? Because I've heard people talk about memory pages a lot. Yes, pages? yeah. Right. So in the virtual address space, each one of these segments is referred to as a page. So when we talk about the page, we're talking about virtual memory. It's a virtual memory page. And each page is mapped to one equivalent page in physical memory, and this is called a page frame or simply a frame. So to distinguish between the two, we use page for virtual memory and frame for physical memory. OK, so that's just to, to, to distinguish between are we talking in physical memory? Are we talking in virtual? All right, so now the address space of each process is split into these pages, and then we create a mapping between each page and um, let's do it this way, and its corresponding physical frame. Yeah. We'll get to that. So, the problem you're referring to, which is great, is now what if I need five kilobytes, right? I take a frame and a little bit. So I take a, I take up, let's say I want five kilobytes, so I'm going to occupy this frame and one kilobyte of this frame. The, the thing that designers of this say is too bad, right? So this problem is called internal fragmentation. So now the fragmentation is not on main memory. It's within the pages themselves. The trick is that you have a trade-off. Do do is it OK to have internal fragmentation and not external fragmentation? I think one could make the argument that it's OK to have a few wasted kilobytes inside the page than to have like a gigabyte of just free space that's kind of here and there. So that's kind of the argument that they make against um, that. Questions? OK, so we're going to map each page to a corresponding physical frame. So we're going to create a mapping between every virtual page and every physical frame. And now we're going to play the same trick that we did before. Let's now move on to a more modern machine. It's 32 bits. And let's say I have four kilobyte pages. So how many bits do I need to offset within a four kilobyte page? Is 
Say that again. Yeah, so four kilobyte is two to the two times two to the ten, which is two to the twelve. So I need the lower twelve bits of my address are gonna be the page offset. So this leaves me with the upper 20 bits being the virtual page number or VPN, which is different than the networking VPN. Okay, so the top 20 bits of my address are going to be the virtual page number. The lower 12 bits are going to be the page offset. So let's, um, and, and then now, if I want to translate an address from a, from a virtual address into a physical address, I'm going to take, split my bits, 20, the top 20 pages, 20 pieces, um, 20 bits, and the lower 12 bits, I take the top 20 bits, I go and ask the operating system, I need the actual page that corresponds to this page number. So it's going to look up this mapping and it's going to tell me which physical page do I reside on, and then we're going to add the offset. So let's take an example just to make this um, clear. So here's how the translation is going to happen. We're going to split our address, or this is virtual address. We're going to split our address, use the page number to index into something we call the page table, which simply contains the mapping between pages and frames. OK, so it's a data structure table that contains a mapping between the page virtual pages and the actual physics physical frames that they map. Then we're going to take that out. From the OS, add it. To the offset. And then we index. Remember using the thing. Questions. So why is why did I say when we said F we wrote F D, but I did say add it, right? So that's not I, we did a concatenation here. We didn't do adding, right? So here's what here's how the addresses are organized. They're at these frame. Um, Frame addresses are organized such that the lower 12 bits are all zeros. So they always point to the first zeroth entry or zeros address in each page. So now when I add D to it, it's just a matter of concatenating the two together. So let's take an example where we have Page three corresponds to frame two, page zero corresponds to frame three, page two to frame five, and page one to frame seven. We are given the virtual address 1010, zero, zero, and we are saying that each page is 16 bytes. Yeah. Page table. Yeah. Okay. So how many bits do we need to represent the offset? So we have each page is 16 bytes. Can you say that again? 14. So remember, I think what we're mixing up is the fact that we are byte addressing. 
So we address byte zero, byte one, byte two, byte three, not actual bits. So when we say 16 bytes in page in, in the page and in, in, in the size of the page, this means that we have 16 indexable or addressable things inside that page. So this leaves us with just four bits for the offset. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna chop this address in two. This is the offset. And this is the virtual page number. So the offset comes down to 0100, which is four. So now the next question is which page, so virtual page, is this address located? Yeah. Two. So we just take this page number and that's going to be page two. Next up is we're going to have to go and look for the page frame. So page two corresponds to frame five. So this is frame five. And finally, putting the physical address together, we're going to have to um, five is one zero one. The offset is zero one. Zero, 0 and that's the physical address that we end up this is going to be 84 in decimal which is basically somewhere here. okay does this make sense okay so now you have everything you need to get started on your homework we're just gonna quickly motivate what we're gonna do next week, which is the following. If I have 20 bits per to represent the virtual page number, how many pages can a process have? So at most, if a process is very, very, very greedy, how many pages can it occupy? Two to the 20, right? So I have 20 bits to represent the number of the virtual page. So at most, I can have two to the 20 pages. And this is about a million pages. So what do you think the size of the page table is going to be? Huge, right? If I have a million pages and I have to store the mappings for those million pages, the page table is going to be very, very large. So I have to take care of that, the fact that the page table can be very large. So I can no longer ask the MMU to please store these four segments with you because the MMU in no way is going to have to room to store 20 million pages or 20 million or 1 million mapping or 2 to the 20 pages. Unfortunately, we're going to have to store the page table in memory itself. So now we have opened another big can of worms. Right? So we were okay because we were asking the hardware to help us out, but now things have gone to a point where like, OK, we solved external fragmentation, but I have this huge table that I have no idea where to put. And I have to put in memory because there's no other place for it to reside. So the next few lectures are going to be dealing with, OK, what do we do with this page table? How do we handle it? And then the problem of the fact that if I want to now access memory, how many memory accesses do I need to do for, per, let's say, if I want to say A of zero is equal to one, how many memory accesses do I need in this case? Two, right? So one to access the page table and one to access the memory itself. So that's what we're going to be looking at um, on Monday. <laughs>